Uh, the next step of pre-processing that is typically done after motion correction is spatial filtering, also known as blurring or smoothing. And the idea is to take the value inside each voxel of the brain and replace it with a weighted average of its own value and the value of the voxels around it. In other words, if you look down here in the middle, let's say this voxel right here, what we would do is we would replace the value of this voxel with one time the value of the voxel um, plus 0.8 times the value of the neighbor above, to the right, below, and to the left, plus 0.6 times the, the value of the voxels on the corners, plus 0.4 times of the voxels to removed, plus 0.3 times the value of the voxels, you know, sort of to removed, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, you're replacing the value of each voxel with kind of a, a, a weighted average of the voxels around it. And the idea behind this is that nearby voxels contain neurons or are observing neurons that probably are doing similar things. So it makes sense that if you can average together neurons, voxels that are reflecting the same neural population, if there's any noise in there, just by averaging it, you're kind of averaging out noise, which means you're decreasing the noise and increasing your signal to noise ratio. So blurring is a means of decreasing, of in, uh, decreasing noise and therefore increasing the signal to noise ratio. Of course, you don't want to smooth too much. You can see on the right what happens the more you smooth your data, the more precision you lose. Lastly, you should know that the way in which we talk about smoothing, we typically describe it in terms of millimeters, full width, half max. So for example, I might smooth my data and say, I'm going to smooth my data five millimeters, full width, half max. What I mean is that the smoothing function, which is this Gaussian function that you see right here, see the numbers of this, of this, uh, of this um, uh, function are exactly the numbers that are in here. Okay. So this function represents how much you're going to smooth all the voxels around the voxel that you're smoothing. The way in which we describe this is the width of this function at half of its peak. So when I say, oh, I'm going to smooth by five millimeters full width half max, what I mean is the function that I'm using at half of its peak right here, the width of it is five millimeters. So that's how we convey how much smoothing we're doing. Now, there are certain advantages and disadvantages to smoothing. On the advantage side, as I said, it does increase the signal to noise ratio. Just imagine having, you know, 20 voxels, they all do the same thing, but they also have some noise into them. If they're all doing the same thing and you average them, the random noise of each individual voxel will be canceled out. So again, smoothing is advantageous because it helps increase our signal to noise ratio. However, there's the so-called matched filter theory. Now the idea is that the best increase in SNR you can get is if you can smooth your data exactly with the same shape and size of your signal. Let me make this more concrete with an example. Say we, this, is a, this is a brain that we're analyzing. Let's focus on this little piece of cortex right here. So I, I'm just zooming it up. So this is a piece of sort of this frontal cortex up here. And let's assume that in fact, the, the truth is that the, all, the, all the neurons in here, all the neurons inside these voxels, they are responding to my task of interest, whatever that might be. Okay, so these voxels contain in them neural populations that are doing, that are responding to my task. The best smoothing I could possibly do would be a smoothing that has exactly, if I smoothed exactly and only the, all the voxels in here, I would, bet I would get the best bang for my buck. Meaning I'll be taking all the voxels that, that, that are responding to my task and, and averaging them together. So I'd be getting rid of all the noise in all these voxels and I would only keep the signal. The problem of course, is that when you start an analysis, you don't know how big and what shape your activations are. That's the end product of your analysis. So you don't really know 
how big the actual signal is and what shape it has. So typically picking how many millimeters you want to smooth is a bit of a balance. Because see, if you smooth it, let's assume that I smooth this much. I'm not doing, I'm not smoothing as much as I could. I'm only averaging these voxels together. And that will help a little bit with the noise, but I could be doing much better if I, if I could smooth all of these, right? On the other end, if I smoothed um, all of these voxels together, it'd be terrible because I'd be, I'd be averaging voxels that have signal in it, those in here, with voxels outside that don't have anything in it. So I'd be dampening down the strength of the signal. So picking how, how, by how much to smooth is a bit of a delicate balance. Um, you might also want to keep in mind um, how big is the structure you care about. If you care about a really tiny structure in the brain, you don't want to smooth much. If you care about, you know, half a lobe, then you probably can smooth more. Now, other important aspects of this. One is that smoothing will allow us later on to employ a technique known as Gaussian field theory. And this is something that we're gonna to see towards the end of this class. But at the very end, when you're trying to decide which voxels are statistically significant and which not, so which reliably vary your task and which do not, um, one of the ways to do that is to apply a technique known as Gaussian field theory. And this requires your data to have certain, a certain smoothness. So applying a smoothing filter at this stage helps you ensure that the hypothesis of that is met so that you can use that tool if you decide to. Finally, look, you're typically testing you know, 20 volunteers. So the neuroanatomy of each of your participants is probably a little bit different. So when you put them all in the same box, their, their anatomies will still be slightly different. So smoothing, sort of blurring a little bit probably might help you know, might help realign uh, individual anatomy or rather might help give you a little more tolerance for differences across individuals in neuroanatomy. However, there also are some disadvantages. First, we've just spent all this money getting and all these gradients to get these tiny, tiny little voxels and now we're losing resolution. So after smoothing, you know, your ability to say, ooh, ooh the signal is in this voxel, not in that voxel, you're kind of losing that. The level at which you can look at your data now, you know, is a little coarser than before. Plus, as I said, if you pick the wrong amount of smoothing, you can damage your data. If you smooth too much, you can drown out signal because you're averaging it with voxels that don't have any signal in it. Here's an example. So this is the exact same analysis, but done at different levels of smoothing, which you're seeing up here. See, when you have zero smoothing, you will notice, see, there's a lot of little voxels and noise. So that's too little. At five millimeters, it's kind of not bad. You get some good activations. But then the more you smooth, the more you start losing activations. Right? Between five and 10, it looks like you get reasonable activations. But then look, once you smooth at 20, you're losing tons of activation. And by the time you smooth 40 millimeters, look, you lost everything. And that's because you're averaging together, as I said earlier, voxels that do have signal with voxels that do not have signal. So you're, you're drowning out your voxels with signal because you're averaging them down with voxels that have nothing in them. So again, picking the right smoothing is a bit of a, is a, bit of a balance between too little and too much.